Hello. Um, so I just wanted to kind of welcome you to um, Principles of Health Science. This is sort of our first official topic of Principles of Health Science. The other one we kind of covered with all of my classes um, was professionalism. Um, while it's really taken from y'all's kind of class, um, the section on professionalism, um, we're really going to kind of get going into how we would normally start um, this class. So we're going to be looking at the history and trends of healthcare. Um, so this is going to show us sort of how healthcare kind of came about and, you know, what did we do in order to get here and all of those good things. Um, it's, I think it's really interesting. A lot of people say, oh, it's history, like, that's boring. But I think it's really interesting because um, there's a lot of important things that you've got to take from this. So let's, um, first of all, I kind of want to point out this, this picture over here that can obviously be pretty interesting. Um, so in this picture, these gentlemen here, which I would assume based on hairstyle, that this is right around 1900, okay? Um, but this person here is obviously dead and they're doing an autopsy on this person. Um, and if you noticed anything, if you really look at this picture, um, these gentlemen are not wearing gloves. Okay. Um, so this is what they used to call bare hands dissection. Probably, like I said, the late 1800s, early 1900s based on their dress. Um, so what are some things that they're not aware of? Uh, maybe that an average person now knows, you know, would be harmful in this kind of situation by doing a dissection without any gloves on, okay? Um, looking kind of at their own other types of safety that they've got. I mean, some of them's got an apron or some sort of coat on to kind of protect their clothes, but, you know, this guy's smoking over here while dissecting. Um, oh, sorry, he is too. Excuse me. Um, so what other precautions are they not taking that, you know, nowadays we would, we would be like, uh, sir, this is, this is all wrong. Okay. So just kind of look at that. All right. So why is it important to know the history of anything? Like why, why are you forced to study history in school? Um, why do you need to know the history of, like, why do you need world history? Why do you need U.S. history? Why do you need Texas history? Okay. So think about why is history important in general? Now apply that to healthcare. Why is it important to know the history of healthcare? Okay. If you really think about it, knowing history, the famous quote, history repeats itself. It's just good to know what happened in the past so we don't make the same mistakes, okay? So in this sense, it's kind of good to know that so that if there was some, you know, study that was done or something like that and they realized that that was wrong, obviously you don't make that same mistake, okay? Also, it's just kind of good to see where you've come from and to see how far you've come so far. Uh, it's always good to kind of reflect in your own life to kind of see where you've come in the last year or the last couple of years, how, how much you've grown, how much you've learned, you know, how different you are, things like that. Okay. All right. So this is a brief history of healthcare and it covers 4,000 BC to present times. Now that is a chunk of time. Okay. So that's roughly what, six, yeah, 6,000 years brief. Okay. I'm going to try and get through it pretty quickly. We're not going to hit the highlights of everything because we would be here for a while. Um, so I'm definitely not going to do that. Um, but I do want to kind of hit some highlights, kind of see what's different from then and what's different now and how we kind of came about to those ideas. Okay. So our first one we're going to look at is ancient times. I'm going to try and figure out where to put myself because I'm going to keep moving. Okay. And ancient times is anywhere between 4,000 BC and 1 AD. Okay. So ancient times already covers 4,000 years worth of history on one side. Okay. We're going to be breezing through this. Okay. Once you, once you get to the turn there from BC to AD, 
you know, those, those next uh, 2,000 years, we're going to um, really kind of dig into it a little bit deeper. Okay? So it said the widely held belief that spirits and demons were the cause of illness. Okay? So that's different from what we believe now. Um, so how did we grow from that? How did we, how did we change our ideas and our thinking about that? Okay. Because the main source of medicine was herbs and plants. Okay. Do we still use that now? And the answer is yes. We do still use a lot of herbs and plants for um, sources of medicine. One of the oldest types of medicine um, is from a plant that we still use today. It's, it's still very relevant to how we treat heart patients because it's a, um, it's called the Jackson and it's from foxglove, which is a plant. Um, and it's something that people use today to help with their, their heart. Okay. So it's definitely still used. So no biggie there. Okay. But the average lifespan was only about 20 years. Okay. So there's definitely some room for improvement. So here's a little picture over here. So this is obviously um, from Egypt, okay? And there, some sort of medical thing is going on here. I'm not really sure because she looks like she's picking that guy's nose with an object. So not really sure what's going on there. But um, looking at the different peoples kind of in the ancient times, we had the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Greeks, we have the Romans, and they all kind of contributed to the progression of healthcare. Okay, so it says uh, the Egyptians took meticulous notes. So that's how we now have our sort of medical records that kind of follow you around. Um, the Chinese proposed the concept of treating the entire body versus just whatever's ailing you right now, which is good. Okay, we have to thank the Greeks for the idea that was almost foreign at the time, which is the theory of cleanliness. Um, you will see even up into almost modern times, you know, the middle 1800s, that they're still struggling with the idea of that hand washing is a good thing. And we'll talk about that guy when we get there, okay? But the Greeks at this time, you know, way back when, we're already stressing the fact that cleanliness is a good thing, okay? So cleanliness and the importance of a good diet Okay. Um, then we also have to thank the Romans where they first organized medical care. Um, so you have things like hospitals that were formed even way back then. They developed sanitation systems such as aqueducts, sewer systems, water filtering systems, and methods to drain standing water and greatly improved um, people's health. And we will see that there was many illnesses that plagued people that came from simple things such as developing a sewer and developing um, water that's being pulled from somewhere that's sanitary, um, such as the aqueducts, and then make sure you're draining water that's standing somewhere. Those three things right there solved all kinds of problems that we had um, back in these days, okay? So let's kind of take a look at that again, I think. Ooh, I may be able to move right here. All right. So we'll take a look at this in just a second. But this is what an aqueduct looks like. Okay. So there's little, like a place for water to run. Okay. And this would carry water from one part of the city to the other. You have to understand that during these times, if you wanted fresh water, you had to walk to that source. Okay. So if you lived two miles away from water, you had to walk two miles to go get the water and then two miles back to carry it back to your home to then use the water, okay? So with this, not only are we transferring it so we don't have, you know, as much travel in order to get fresh water, um, so it made that easier, but then it's also not traveling anywhere on the ground though either, which is good, okay? We'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, they had the concept of having public bathhouses, which was a good and bad thing. One, it did keep people clean because they were actually taking a bath, not like once every couple of months, but you know, they could do it more often. But the bad thing is that you have everybody bathing in one pool. Now, um, once they started creating that water filtering system, 
then the disease rate kind of dropped in these bathhouses as well, which was good, okay? Because it used to be a source of infection for lots of different things, and we'll talk about that, okay? And then developing of public restrooms. This is, this is a public restroom. I noticed that there's no stalls for you to graffiti or anything like that. I guess maybe you could write on the cement here, whatever. Anyways, um, so having a designated location for somebody to go to the bathroom was a huge deal, okay? Um, people kind of just went wherever they wanted to go. Um, you had the concept of like, there's no indoor plumbing. So where do you go to the bathroom in your house? Well, you go outside. Um, you had outhouses. Um, you had what are called chamber pots. And chamber pots is you had a, a bowl sat in your room. And if you had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night or during the day, you went in this pot. And then every so once in a while, you would dump it out. And I'm talking about like you could just open the window on your second floor and just dump it out. And that could be in the middle of, you know, the street, you know, watch out below, like, and then just chunk it out. Like it's, it was bad. Okay. Um, and like I said, seriously, seriously, people would just dump it in the streets and it would run along the streets. Um, maybe they had sidewalks and then you had the actual road. You've got horses and buggies that are going through there with all of the horses doing their business on the road. You've got people who just dumped their stuff in the road. You've got all this filth. I mean, you can imagine the stink that's happening at this point. They didn't clean a lot of that stuff up until the 1800s. So we're talking about many years of living in this nasty filth. Um, no wonder there were so many people that lived out kind of by themselves out in the middle of nowhere because nobody wanted to live in cities where it was just, it was rough living in cities. Okay. All right, let me move this up out of there. All right, so let's talk about some common infections, uh, infectious diseases that happened during the ancient times, okay? So I'm going to read off in order this way. So we're going to talk about typhoid, then malaria, cholera, whatever. And as I'm reading, you're going to figure out which, um, which one that goes to, okay? And then you're going to mark it on your slides, okay? All right. So typhoid is a bacterial infection caused by salmonella. Salmonella you've heard of probably quite often because we have salmonella outbreaks all the time um, with like food, especially produce and stuff that hasn't been washed properly, okay? And it is spread via contaminated food and or water. And when we're talking about contaminated, usually we're talking like fecal oral contamination. So somebody goes to the bathroom, didn't wash their hands, handles produce, it lives on the produce, you consume it, you now get sick, okay? Um, salmonella can cause things like simple, you know, food poisoning and things like this. This particular salmonella, you know, from biology or, you know, if you haven't quite gotten into biology yet, um, if you know from science, usually if you talk about a bacteria, it's got two names. So this is salmonella typhi, okay? Um, so this one, Typhi produces typhoid, okay? Um, and it can cause fevers almost to the point of getting to 105 degrees, okay? So really high um, fevers at this point, and again, contaminated by food and water, okay? Um, then we have malaria. And malaria is what we call a vector-borne disease. So the parasite is getting to us via an animal. That's what makes it a vector-borne, okay? So this is a parasite that infects mosquitoes, and then the mosquito bites you, and then it transfers the parasite to you, okay? So it causes an extremely high fever. Um, you can have chills where you shake really bad, and then kind of flu-like symptoms, okay? So you think, well, you know, well, what's bad about malaria? What's bad about typhoid? Um, you have to think about those high fevers. Those high fevers, especially in places where you can't control it, that can kill you or it can cause severe brain damage and things like that. So you want to, you know, it's still going to be something that can be deadly. Okay. Cholera and dysentery are very similar. So I want you to kind of um, really pay attention pretty closely to this. Okay. So cholera is also a bacterial infection and it is caused by Vibrio cholerae. 
and it is spread by contaminated food and water, okay? Symptoms include severe watery diarrhea, vomiting, and leg cramps due to dehydration, okay? Now, when I'm saying severe watery diarrhea, you think about your worst case of diarrhea and multiply it by about 10, okay? I'm talking about Niagara Falls at your bottom, okay? Just water, nothing else, no materials, no nothing, just water, okay? So if you're losing all of that water, you're going to die of dehydration real quick. And I'm talking like a couple of hours, you're gone, okay? So cholera is one of those really bad ones. So severe watery diarrhea. Uh, the loss of fluid leads to severe dehydration, which eventually leads to shock where your blood pressure can't be maintained and your organs start shutting down and you die, okay? Now, dysentery is caused by a bacteria, but it's Shigella dysenteriae, okay? It's also spread by contaminated food and water, and the symptoms are similar to cholera, but the difference is, is that the diarrhea for this one is actually bloody, okay? So not only are you losing water, but you're also losing blood too. And the reason it's bloody is because the cholera, the bacteria, goes into the lining of your intestines and actually destroys it. But then as it's destroying it, you're also bleeding at the same time. Okay. Neither one sound lovely and I don't want any of them. All right. Leprosy. Okay. It is now known as Hansen's disease because leprosy, the name of it has gotten such a kind of uh, what do you call it? It's not a taboo. What do you call it? A kind of, I don't know. I'll probably insert the word somewhere where you can see it. I don't know. Um, but it's just one of those diseases that nobody wants to talk about. You know, you kind of hear about it and it, immediately people are like, oh, leprosy. Like, so they renamed it Hansen's disease just to make it more friendly, I guess, whatever. Um, so this is caused by a bacteria. This is Mycobacterium leprae. Leprae. Oh my goodness. Um, so it is a very, very, very slow growing bacteria. And I'm talking like you can get, um, you can come in contact with this particular bacteria and you might not show symptoms for like 20 years. Kind of depends on how good your immune system is at that point. So it can take anywhere between one and 20 years before you develop symptoms from this particular bacteria, okay? Now its cousin, this particular bacteria's cousin is tuberculosis, which you may or may not be familiar with. So leprosy and tuberculosis are pretty, um, as far as their bacteria are pretty similar, okay? Um, so leprosy can cause severe nerve damage and muscle weakness. Um, there's various forms of leprosy. Most people think about like the skin disorder that kind of comes with it. Um, and that's just one variant of leprosy, okay? Smallpox is our last one. And this is caused by a virus called variola. And it causes these fluid-filled bumps to appear all over the skin. And then they later scab over. And the victim is then left with scars. So you're talking about these fluid-filled bumps all over your body. We're talking the palms of your hand, which is weird, and the soles of your feet, all over your face, all over your body. Um, they hurt, you have a fever, and then you're scarred with it for the rest of your life. So somebody who has had smallpox, you can tell because you can, you know, you can see the evidence of it, okay? All right, so I think I reveal the answers to you, which, Hopefully you kind of put these together by yourself. Okay, so the first one um, with the rash all over the body was the smallpox, okay? Causes severe watery diarrhea. Just the watery diarrhea is cholera, because remember, bloody diarrhea is gonna be the dysentery, okay? Contaminated food and water causing a high fever is typhoid. Infected by mosquitoes is definitely mal malaria. So think in mosquitoes and malaria, okay? Nervous system. Um, with leprosy. Don't necessarily think skin, because like I said, it's just one type of leprosy. Not all of them are going to cause the skin issues. And then, like I said before, dysentery is going to go with the bloody diarrhea. Okay. Now, on the next slide, I do want to kind of 
tell you that you are going to see smallpox and what that looks like, um, which is why I've got the little asterisk marks up there to remind me because sometimes I, you know, put up a photo up there and I'm like, Ooh, sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to show you, it's not that disturbing, but I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up before I just flash the picture in there for you. Okay. So the first one, okay, so the fluid filled sacs all over the body looks like this. Okay. So this is somebody's hand. So that's a thumb right there and index finger, middle finger, hand, arm. Okay. Just kind of give you reference because it's so close up. Okay. So we're talking about fluid filled sacs, which is going to make your skin hurt because it's being stretched. Okay. Um, if these bust and you get an infection on top of that, that's also going to make everything hurt, um, which could cause complications from it. Um, again, once they do bust, um, they scab over and scar, which means you are left, even without these little pockets of fluid, you're still left with all these scars all over your body. Okay. So here is evidence found of smallpox on mummies. And you think, okay, well, how would you know if a mummy had smallpox? Because, you know, they're just bones now, right? But it actually scarred all the way down to where you could actually see it on their bones too, okay? So we know that smallpox is a really, really old disease because we see evidence of it in um, remains that are found from long ago, okay? So interesting enough. I like how he's got these cobwebs on his eyes right here. It's, it's a fun little detail. All right, moving on. So a historical figure highlight. We're going to see these as we kind of go through here. So we're going to um, highlight one person out of ancient times, one person that contributed to healthcare. care. Uh, so we narrowed it down to somebody really special. Um, so this individual is Hippocrates. Okay, so um, you can see when he lived down here. Sorry that I just covered it up. But um, 460 to 7... <laughs> dyslexic. 460 to 377 BC. Okay. So Hippocrates is considered the father of medicine. Okay, because he developed a couple of things, which we'll talk about. So he developed methods to observe the body and how disease affects it. Okay. So my senior level class, Pathophysiology, studies just that. Okay. It studies like after you come out of anatomy and physiology and understand how, you know, the names of everything and how things function. So if you understand the lungs and how you, how gas exchange occurs within the lung tissue between that and the capillaries. And then now you get into pathophysiology where you're talking about pneumonia. Well, what does pneumonia do? Well, you have fluid that's now in the lungs. Well, what is that going to do to the gas exchange between the lungs and the capillaries? It's going to decrease it, which is why you get all your symptoms, okay? So that's my senior level class that we talk about that in, okay? He also recorded signs and symptoms of various diseases. This is extremely helpful because if somebody, if you see the same kind of symptoms coming in all the time, you know, you might want to say, Okay, well, let's call that something. Let's call that a particular disease, okay? So they were able to do that, which is a good thing. Oh, I'm going to be Hippocrates. Okay, anyways, he also created the standard of ethical practice. So just making sure that, again, ethics has to do with what's right and what's wrong, like morally right and wrong. So you can't, you know, kill your patient because they didn't like you or whatever. Like you can't do that because that's not right. Okay. Um, and from this, we get what's called the Hippocrates Oath, which is taken by doctors after they finish medical school. So they take this oath like right before they graduate. It's this cute little ceremony. Like it's, I don't know. I'll talk about the oath that I took graduating from nursing school when we get to Nightingale. All right, I'm gonna move. You see Hippocrates again. So let's talk about the Middle Ages. And the Middle Ages are is, is kind of an intense time period. Okay. So it is 400 to 1400 AD. Okay. So it covers roughly a thousand years of time. 
and some stuff went on in those thousands of years, okay? So the beginning of this time was called, known as the Dark Ages. And why was it called the Dark Ages? Because there was a lot of death and there was a lot of bad things that happened during that time. The first thing that kind of set all this stuff up is that the Roman Empire fell. If you know anything about that, you know that the Roman Empire fell. The Roman Empire was like this, like, really great empire that sort of was what everybody looked up to in the world. They were very important. They were very influential. And it fell. Okay? Now, I'm not talking like you tripped and you fell, but like you broke apart. It was no longer powerful. Things like that. Not, not trip falling. Okay? All right. Anyways. So that kind of set things off. Okay? And because it fell, uh, people stopped losing started losing interest in trying to better life because they were so worried about what was going on um, and just sort of maintaining their, you know, being and being alive that they weren't really worried about all of the, you know, stuff that was, that was going on. So, so medicine kind of took a couple of steps backwards. Okay. But by the end of the middle ages, once, things kind of settled, then the interest kind of grew again. And then we've got, we got medical universities coming out of this time period, which is good because now everybody's learning um, the same thing so that as they go and practice medicine, you know, they've all learned the same thing. It's kind of like why you go to school. You go to school and everybody in Texas learns the same thing because then all of the students that are going out into society after they turn 18 have kind of the same basic knowledge. Okay. So you want to do that for anybody, whatever career they're doing. Okay. Around the 1300s, we were hit with something really big, the bubonic plague. Now you may have heard of the bubonic plague before or the plague or um, the black plague, anything you want to call it. Um, and this was a major event. Notice here that it says it killed three-fourths of the population of Europe and Asia. Okay, now Europe and Asia is where mostly everybody was kind of gathered. That's where a majority of the world population was, besides like Africa. Okay, so you're thinking you're killing off three-fourths of that population. That is a dramatic drop. Okay, now if you think about the world population now, it is intensely more than what it would have been back in the 1300s. But regardless, three-fourths of the population dying is a huge amount, okay? So, um, I mean, this was, this was a big deal, okay? So the plague um, is caused by a bacteria called Yersinius pestis, which we'll see in just a second. There's several different forms of the plague. Um, but the most famous one is called the bubonic plague. And it's named because the um, it creates these things, what they call buboes, and I'll explain those in just a second. This is the bacteria infects a flea, which then bites a human, okay? And then what that bacteria does to humans is it makes your lymph nodes swell. Now, you've got lymph nodes all over your body. You've got you know, some in your neck, you've got some under your arms, um, you've got several in your torso area, in kind of your groin area, and kind of in your legs and things like that, and it would make them swell, and that's what they would call those buboes, okay? <sighs> I hate this, I hate this thing so much, okay? So this is what is known as the plague doctor. You may have seen this and not know what it is, but this is the plague doctor, and we're going to watch this video real quick, um, that kind of explains the plague doctor and what what they did and why they dressed the way they did. Okay, so let's watch this real fast. So why are PAs any good? And just a quick side note, if you can't hear this very well, um, obviously in your own copy of this PowerPoint, you have the ability to also click and play this. So if it doesn't work, Doctor, the 17th century. In Italy, 1656 through 57, devastating outbreaks of bubonic plague in Naples, Rome, and Genoa killed approximately 200 to 400,000 people. If 
it's unknown where this deadly plague originated, but it's said to have spread from Naples, where restrictions and precautions were non-existent. In these cities, plague doctors were hired to treat plague patients, especially for the poor who could not afford treatment. The doctor's costume was designed to protect them from what was thought of as evil smells or bad air, which was seen as the cause of infection at the time. This is now known as the medically obsolete miasma theory. In reality, the plague was caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, which exists in fleas found on rats. The infected would have flu symptoms followed by swollen and painful lymph nodes, gangrene, and vomiting of blood, with death following within a week from infection. Some historians point to Charles Delorme as the inventor of the costume, which was modeled after a soldier's armor. The most striking feature was a bird-beak-like mask with crystal glasses. The mask was more than aesthetic and acted as a respirator filled with dried flowers or spices which the doctor breathed through, protecting them from contagions. The doctor would also wear a long Moroccan leather gown that tucked into the mask to prevent contact with the patient, and the surface was waxed to prevent miasmas sticking to the surface. A friar named Father Antero Maria da San Bonaventura observed that those who worked in the playhouse while wearing the waxy robe did not catch the disease. He noted that it stopped fleas nesting on the person and was therefore close to discovering the true reason behind the plague. Unfortunately, he discounted the fleas as merely an annoyance rather than carriers of the disease. And furthermore, as the clothing didn't protect the wearer from miasmas, he would discount the value of waxed robes as well. The doctor would also wear gloves, boots, and a wide-brimmed hat to show his profession and hold a wand or cane to examine and issue instruction without touching the patient. Methods of treatment for the miasma, which was really the plague, were ineffective. Remedies included bloodletting and the use of leeches on the affected areas. Prescriptions of toads or spiders were also given to absorb the bad air. The plague doctor's appearance was quite terrifying for patients as it was a sign of impending death and they were kept out of the way of the public due to the nature of their profession. All right, Mr. Dramatic here who did the video. Um, yeah, the plague doctors are not my favorite and it's not really just because they're a plague doctor. I just, I can't get over their costume. Their costume creeps me out. Can't do it. Anywho, um, <clears throat> So, as he said, um, there was a couple of different reasons why they wore what they did. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of information that they were kind of going on as to what they thought caused the plague, which is obviously not correct. So, let's kind of talk about that. So, it says, based on the video, what ideas have changed in regards to how infectious diseases are transmitted? Okay. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff. They talked about the miasma theory, and the miasma theory talked about that there was bad air or bad smells that would cause disease. Now, it's they weren't talking about what's in the air. They were talking about that the air itself was bad, like you came from a bad family and therefore you had bad air, kind of like the uh, terms of like bad blood, okay? Um, now, obviously, you know, it would take a while before we would discover things like bacteria and viruses and things like that. And understanding that, that is where um, illnesses come from. But that guy was so close to coming to the fact that it was fleas. And then he totally discounted it. So that was, it was almost there. Um, which is very unfortunate because he could have been famous, but now he's not. All right. Anyways. Um. So there's lots of things that have changed, but again, you have to understand that the bubonic plague happened in the 1300s, right? So it's been a while. We have new technologies uh, and we can kind of come from that. But I just find it very interesting. And like I said before, the plague just, um, there's different things that you can kind of look into with the plague. Um, it's a very interesting time period. And there was just sort of a lot of things that were going on that kind of contributed to the plague. Um, like I said, there was like the fall of Rome and you had, you know, 
people aren't living clean and there's all kinds of stuff that was going to, it was just sort of like this perfect storm that kind of happened, um, which you see with a lot of pandemics that occur. Um, and so this was definitely a huge pandemic that, that happened. Okay. All right. I am going to cover the Renaissance real fast just because I think we have enough time and we'll stop after the Renaissance, but Renaissance is pretty short and sweet. All right, so the Renaissance happens between um, 1350 and 1650. Anybody know, well, not that you can answer me because this is recorded, um, but Renaissance is a French word and it means rebirth. Okay, so you come from the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages where, you know, people were dying and kingdoms were falling and things were just bad to kind of this new idea, this new hope of we can do better. Um, and so it's just sort of this rebirth kind of idea. Put this up over here. All right. Okay, so religious groups finally allowed the practice of dissection. Um, what we didn't kind of cover from the beginning is that way back in ancient times, they allowed dissection a little bit, but they ran into religious groups that would tell them that you can't do that. And so for the longest time, they could not do dissections. So dissections, again, is cutting open and really examining and looking. Um, especially on, now you could do it on animals, but you couldn't do it on humans. But with the re, uh, Renaissance, they were now allowing this kind of practice, which is going to make huge leaps and bounds um, for the area of medicine. Because now you can look inside a human and try to figure out, you know, what exactly is going on in there um, and really discovering things. So this, this opened up doors, okay? And this leads to the creation of the first anatomy textbooks, okay? So if you can peel the skin off and now see what the muscles look like, you can then draw it for others and make massive copies of it. And now you've got all these textbooks that people can kind of see, okay? And the average lifespan kind of increased a little bit to 30 to 40 years. So it came from about 20 to 30 to 40 years. So we kind of doubled our lifespan, which is good, okay? So here is, um, which we'll talk about da Vinci in just a second, but this is one of da Vinci's drawings, um, kind of really examining a skull, okay? And during the Renaissance period, you had people that were making sculptures. Yes, I know his butt is hanging out there. Um, but anyways, so you had these sculptures that are coming out during the Renaissance and maybe you've always kind of thought of, well, maybe you haven't, you've, you haven't taken art appreciation in college yet. So maybe this thought hasn't occurred to you. But if you look at art, there's this sort of, there's this vast change right before the Renaissance of things looking very not real. And then once you hit the Renaissance, everything started looking very realistic. You look at the sculptures and the paintings and the drawings and things like that, and they look really legit like okay again minus this guy's butt but i mean looking at the muscle like look at his calf like that looks legit and his foot looks like it's actually standing on this rock and that there's you know that there's weight to it um and things like i can't say much about his hair but you know whatevs but i mean it looks very realistic and you might ask yourself well what was the change what happened okay so be a lot of people who take art and like i'm talking about like going to college and take art you're actually required to take like an anatomy class because once you understand the underlining structures of somebody's face like the cheekbones and how the jaw works and all that other good stuff and seeing that all the stuff that's kind of underneath that it's going to make your drawings look more realistic okay because now you kind of understand where that cheekbone is, then, you know, your cheekbone, when you draw it, is going to look real, okay, and accurate. So just fun, fast fact. All right, so our historical figure for um, the Renaissance here, like I just said, we just mentioned him just a second ago, is going to be da Vinci, okay? So he lived between 14... 52 and 1519 BC. I should probably say AD, not BC. Ignore that. Okay, it should say AD. Okay. Anyways, 
Um, so he came up with a lot of different things. He was an inventor. He was a painter. Um, like, like I said with the previous slide, he, he you know, drew that skull there. Okay. So this is Da Vinci's man here. Um, so he has this drawing and kind of representation. But again, sort of that, uh, that art that's kind of coming out of this time period, but also because of all of the dissection that's being allowed, things are looking a little bit more realistic. Okay. Like I said, we are stopping at the Renaissance. So our next time period that we're going to cover is the 16th through 19th century. Um, we'll pick up there and we're going to have leaps and bounds that we're going to make in these next um, hundreds of years that come following this time period. Um, and we'll kind of look at how things change. But coming from this era, seeing what they used to believe caused illness to what we know now, again, why is it that studying this is so important? Um, just kind of makes, makes more sense, okay? So we'll come back later and we'll talk about the 16th and 19th century time periods. Um, and what's really interesting is like the 20th century because we have massive expansion of things lots of things being created even in the 21st century that we now live in lots of different things that are going on and it's really interesting what we can actually do now okay um so we'll take a look at that later um but for now we're gonna go ahead and say goodbye and we'll pick up then later okay